My name is Joran Radom and I am happy to be part of the festival committee this year. And today I have taken a trip up to Hamar uh, to the Norwegian Emigrant Museum. And I'm very excited to be able to meet the museum director, Terje Hasle Joranger. And thank you, and you're heartily welcome to the Norwegian Immigrant Museum, and, and thank you. Uh, we're very proud to be a part of the program at the Leif Eriksen Festival uh, this year. And uh, Tarje, I understand that you also have um, connections to the US and to the, um, to the Norwegian and Scandinavian population there. Yes. Uh, um, I Throughout the years I've been working uh, on uh, doing research on Norwegian uh, immigration to the United States. And I have made many acquaintances and friends uh, throughout these years. And uh, I think that we have some acquaintances in, in common. Uh, among others, uh, I've uh, been a part of the program on the uh, Tuesday open house in the Minnekirken in Minneapolis. And now several uh, who are uh, involved in those activities. And, uh, and I, have, I have so many fond memories uh, from, uh, from my trips uh, over there and uh, so I'm really happy that, to be a part of this festival because we, I may know many of those who are already will be listening. One main focus for um, the festival this year is the Sami culture and uh, correlations to the Native American traditions in Minnesota and the US and I understand that we will even get uh, uh, a a taste of that in in your exhibition here. And yes, we also include the um, the uh, relationship between those the, the white Norwegian settlers to the United States and the indigenous population, and the fact that the indigenous population had been driven away or were not present when Norwegians took the land, and that there are two different ways of perceiving uh, ownership and the use of the land is also of great interest. And we also have uh, some uh, ties also to the, to the Norwegian, um, what the authorities have done to the Sami population throughout the years. So we wish to, to create some ties in an understanding with, between how the indigenous population has been um, treated uh, in, on several continents uh, con connected to Norway. Um, but now I am I'm, I'm pleased to give you a tour of the museum. This museum uh, has been here since the late 1990s uh, and it consists of eight antique buildings uh, which have been moved from the upper Midwest, from the states of Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, North and South Dakota. And they form a, a permanent exhibit that is part of the, uh, to show the immigrant experience. So the tour is based on these buildings and we will uh, tell the story about Norwegian immigration uh, by doing this tour. We also have three uh, separate exhibits uh, that we will include in the, uh, in the tour. But uh, it all started uh, about in 1914 when there was, a, uh, the, um, there was a great exhibit in the Frogner Park to commemorate the, Nor the signing of the Norwegian uh, uh, constitution in 1914. Uh, when, um, when the idea was created to establish a museum uh, that could take care of the heritage of those who emig had emig emigrated from Norway. Because in 1914, emigration was still very large from Norway. So this was in the consciousness of Norwegians, emigration was. So, um, but then the war broke out, the, the World War I broke out during that uh, exhibit. Uh, that summer, and also we, you had a Second World War uh, and some and the 1930s, where, when it was difficult to to work on these plans. But in the 1940s, uh, some um, uh, some ties were created between the Nordmansforbundet, the Northmen's Federation in Norway, and the Sons of Norway, the Bygdelagenes Fellesråd, and also the Consul General in uh, Norwegian Consul General in Minneapolis. They cooperated and got to, they found a building in North Dakota that was used by the Sons of Norway 
that was dismantled and moved to Norway as the first building as, uh, in the museum. It was, it was moved to the Norwegian uh, Folk Museum in Oslo, where it was supposed to, to be a part of a, a 13 farm plan uh, that, that should show regional variations in buildings in Norway. So the, so the, emig the, emigrant, uh, so the emigrant cabins should constitute one of these 13. And this building behind us here became the Norwegian Emigrant Museum in 1955. Uh, soon it, it was clear that there was not enough space uh, at the museum uh, because uh, another building was moved as well from Minnesota. Uh, so it was decided that these buildings should be moved to a different location, to a new museum. Stavanger uh, was one of the options, but Stavanger, because that was where the first direct immigration to the United States took place in 1925, but the climate in Stavanger is a, is a, a coast, coastal climate, and these buildings were built in the in a, in a dry uh, and more drier climate in the upper Midwest. So uh, Hedmarksmuseet or Domkirkeoden in Hamar uh, received the buildings. Soon, uh, in 1988, the Norwegian Immigrant Museum became an independent museum because we had been part of other museums before. And the buildings were then moved to a location near the Mjøsa Lake. Then in 1995, a big flood came and the flood affected the buildings so that we had to move the buildings to higher grounds. And this, this area where we are located now uh, was an institutional area uh, um, that was vacated at the time. And the buildings were moved here where they are safe and where we would we also had the chance to grow and to establish and to move other buildings. So that's the reason why we, we are here. This is the Kindred House, built in 1873, uh, near the town of Kindred in North Dakota. And, and this was uh, used as a communal building for the, for the settlers who lived here. It, it had various uh, purposes. Uh, it was used as the first church, and as the first schoolhouse, as the first grocery store, and also as the first uh, uh, land office, because there was ample of land around here so that so the the deeds were signed here when you transferred land from the government to the local settlers this is where the the office was later uh, a new church was built in a separate location a new school was built but this was the very first building used for common purposes in the settlement it later became a, a dwelling house uh, where uh, various families did live uh, and the first pastor in the area lived upstairs for a while. His name was Helle Stvett. Um, and, but, and it was in use until 19, our, our, the late 1920s, when it was sold to the Sons of Norway, who used it as a, as a, as a building for their organization before it was dismantled and moved to Norway. On the wall here, you will see uh, the, the route that the emigrants took in 1873 from Norway to North Dakota. They, they traveled by sail. So the st steamers had, be, had um, started to be, there were steamers also in production, but there were still uh, sailing ships. So uh, this is from an agent archive at the museum from 1871. And this shows the, the sailing vessels went through uh, from Norway, through the English Channel, to uh, Canada by way of Quebec and down the Great Lakes. And then they found various ports uh, in Wisconsin or in Illinois where they uh, landed and went 
inland from there. And here you see the, this is the, uh, the, the site of this uh, building in North Dakota. As you see, it's a uh, prairie <laughs> and very different from where many of the newcomers came from. And Norwegians were, uh, are, there are two important characteristics about Norwegian uh, immigrants. The one is that they, a very high percentage of Norwegians chose to settle on land. They became landed and lived in rural areas. They liked the rural uh, uh, surroundings. Another important trait is that they settled very much in clusters, tightly together. So this is a township map, uh, this administ administrative unit, uh, showing many Norwegian names uh, in close proximity to one another. And that was very common. In that way they could keep traditions, they could keep the language going, and they keep, could keep the Lutheran faith in many instances. Um, and you see they also chose to settle near a, a river because they could get uh, water and also lumber for the building. And here is a deed uh, showed by, written by the, signed by the US president, Grover Cleveland. He was not actually a signer, but this shows the, this is the deed of this property um, at the time. And it was, it's, it's federal land. This was a part of the, uh, the Homestead Act in 1862 comprised this, uh, this area. So larger lots of 160 acres were sold uh, in this area. And we also have, may also think, uh, if you look at, this, this, at this, this room, this was also the site, the, air, uh, uh, the site of, uh, of the uh, interior of sailing vessels where, where, the, peop where, where the passengers uh, were. So it, it's not very large. But, and you can imagine if, there were, if the weather was bad, uh, that they still all have to be in one room together, and there were children crying, and they were sick. Uh, but then finally, uh, they could go you know, uh, upstairs when uh, the storm was over. Uh, it's also important that we, we can think about slave ships that were at one time with similar uh, 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 area, but that the, the, the slaves were chained together and did not have the same chance to walk around like the immigrants did. That was, that was what we call forced migration. So, so, it's, so, so it's kind of mind-boggling to think about these various types of transportation across the Atlantic Ocean. It puts things into perspective. This building was uh, built in Minnesota around 1883 on homestead land by Knut and Maria Gunderson. And uh, Knut was from Krödsarad in, in for, former Buskerud um, county in Norway. And he and his wife raised uh, several children in this one room building. And this building was moved to the Immigrant Museum in 1963. It was donated by Knut's grandchild, grandson, who then owned the farm. And the reason why this building was, uh, was kept like it is, is that the Knut and Maria, they built another house because they had, addition, uh, they had more children. So, and this was used as a summer kitchen because summers were so hot and, uh, in, in, uh, in the Midwest. So, they, so for cooking purposes, it was easier to cook outside in this building. So it, it was located just beside the, uh, the newer building for many years. So we, can you imagine the, um, how primitive really it was and to raise four to five, uh, to five children in, in uh, this building. But in, in many ways, by moving this building to Norway, it can also be preserved. We don't know the fate of these buildings if they had been lo still been located in, 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 in the U.S. So uh, we're very thankful that we had a chance to do so. So this, this is a farmyard consisting of uh, buildings from three different states. This, uh, the dwelling is from Minnesota. 
the barn is from Iowa. And then you have two build buildings here. One is from Iowa and the other from Wisconsin. And these buildings were used for various purposes. They, each building had uh, a purpose. In my mind, these buildings look like what we would call Lue in, in Norway, where we would keep the hay through the su summer. Is that what it was used for? Or Yes, the, you, you would believe that it's, it's a hay barn or a place where you store the hay, which, which was important uh, produce at the far farm. But in fact, the, the building above here is a, a corn crib. Um, and the corn uh, was not common in Norway. So, so Norwegian settlers, they adapted the, Nor the American name and Norwegianized it. So they called it corn crib, uh, which is uh, it's interesting because they changed the language and which also shows that they were uh, in a process from being uh, immigrants to becoming Norwegian Americans. It's, it's the adapt adaptation process to, the, to, uh, to America. Then behind us we have uh, another building. This is a granary where the grain was kept. Uh, and Norwegians used, usually refer to that building as a grønneri, which was similar, but which did not have any sense, meaning in Norwegian. And uh, Norwegian immigrants adapted to American, the American market economy. Many of them came from a self-subsistence, where they lived off the produce from the farm. But in, in the US, the market was much more important. So cash crops, uh, where you could sell your crops and receive cash directly was, was more common. So it was not uncommon that uh, Norwegians kept the grain uh, for several months uh, to ensure that the prices rose so they will get more uh, cash for the crops. This is the, the Sack Whitney barn, um, built in Iowa around 1860 by an immigrant from Granvin in Hardanger. This an addition was built later uh, to the left, and the farm in the U.S. is still in the same family. Um, but we use it uh, as um, for exhibits. So this, the part to the right here, uh, is an exhibit about a Norwegian musher, um, who his name is Leonard Seppala from Troms, and you see the dog here. That's his lead dog Togo. Um, because Seppala was, uh, he emigrated in 1900 from Norway uh, because he wanted to become a, 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 to be a gold digger in Alaska. Several of his friends has, has left before him. But then soon he started to realize that he, he, his interest was more in sports and in mushers as a hundekjøring with dog sleds. So he started to compete and became a very an avid, a very very uh, good um, sportsman, and 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 had many trophies. In 1925, uh, diphtheria diphtheria broke out in the, the the town of Nome in Alaska where he lived, and children got sick. This was in January, so they had to uh, find serum, a serum that could be transported. There were no roads. Uh, no airplanes, no trains. So uh, mushers were called in to organize uh, a race where they transported the serum from the closest railway station to Nome. And Seppala and Togo, the lead dog, they had the, they had the largest uh, uh, of these uh, stages, uh, more than a thousand kilometers uh, over an ocean that was uh, with ice. So, and, but Togo was not uh, the dog who transported the, the, the last stage, that was a, uh, there was a dog called Balto who, that transported the serum. And Balto got all the, uh, became all the fame. Balto had a statue erected in um, New York, Central Park, he had books, and movies, but Togo was forgotten. So this is a way to uh, uh, to show that Togo also 
deserves a place in the Norwegian American history. Um, and in, in here you also, in the exhibit, you also will see that uh, Roald Amundsen, the, the, the polar explorer, also knew Seppala. Uh, but Seppala and Roald Amundsen were only, f could, were only on the same, uh, had the same status in the snow because Roald Amundsen felt superior uh, because Seppala was, his father was of Finnish descent, was what we call the Kven in Norway, and the Kvens were supported, were not considered to be pure Norwegians. His mother was Norwegian, but, but the Kvens were marginalized. So in the United States, Leonard Seppala, he dressed in the Inuit costume, and he felt more um, at ease with the Inuits than the, the white um, Americans. So it's important. So we also see here um, that uh, a group of people, the Kvens, were also looked down upon in Norway. But, and um, we so see also the same with the Inuits uh, in the United States. They belonged, they were on the lower echelons of uh, this uh, racial society, racial hierarchy in the United States. To be white, to be Norwegian, uh, and also to be Protestant, uh, was uh, a way to, to get access to the American middle class. We also have some slides here uh, from uh, old photos that show the uh, Norwegian immigrant experience. And the music that you can uh, hear uh, is an America letter from 1873 uh, that was recorded by a group uh, in our church at the museum. We have now left the, uh, the first generation buildings that were built by Norwegian, the first generation of Norwegian immigrants. And uh, now we're on the way to the buildings built by the second generation. But th this statue is also a part of the museum uh, exhibit. Uh, this is called the Handcart Pioneers. And it shows a um, uh, marginalized group, a religious group, namely the uh, the Mormons, um, the Jesus Christ Church of the Latter-day Saints. Oh, about 5,000 Norwegian immigrants uh, belong to that uh, faith. And, it's all, and this also symbolizes the, uh, religious immigration, uh, immigration for religious purposes. And we can, we, can, we can go back to 1825 with the restoration, when uh, Quaker and Haugian sympathizers, Haugi, Haugi was a uh, lay minister, lay uh, preacher in Norway, uh, and, and a part in way of the state church, but yet uh, marginalized by the authoritarian state church. And um, the Handcart Pioneers, this is a statue. The original is standing in Salt Lake City in U Utah. Uh, it's made by Torleif Knapphus from Vats in Rogaland a Norwegian uh, who adhered to that faith. Um, and it, it tells about the hardships of the migrants who were um, persecuted uh, when they were living in Missouri and in the, in the Midwest. They were persecuted, their leader uh, was uh, assassinated, and they did not feel safe. So a way to escape and to form their own um, land, their own territory, uh, was found in Utah. So this tells about the handcart. They walked from the Midwest to Utah with all their belongings. And it also may also symbolize the hardships when you come to a new country to start, start from the beginning.
So we have an exhibit in the next building. This is a building um, that was one of the, the, the more uh, recent ones, built in 1902 uh, by a second generation uh, immigrant family. But we have used the, 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 uh, uh, base, the basement for exhibits. And our exhibit here uh, is about uh, Andrew Larson Dahl, a Norwegian from Valdres, who became a photographer. And he has taken some amazing photos uh, from 1869 to, 19, to 1877 from Norwegian settlements in Wisconsin that, that are really clear and that shows the, how, how they, they lived at the time, costumes, um, building techniques, uh, machinery, uh, and who were present on the photos. So on one photo you also have the Norwegian flag with the Swedish colors in one of the corners uh, in the 1870s. This, is, this building is what we call the, the Bjorgo house, uh, built in 1902. And the first family that lived here was named Ingvaldsen. So the name of our cafe, which is in this building, is called the Ingvaldsen's Cafe. Uh, Mr. Ingvaldsen was an immigrant from Hemsedal in, uh, in Hallingdal, Norway. Uh, and he lived here for a number of years. In 1916, the Bjorgo family, originally from the Norwegian west coast, uh, moved in here. And this family lived here until the late 1970s. Uh, so uh, we, we received the, the building uh, some time ago and we built it in, in 2017. And we used it as a, as a cafe. And we also have used it for um, various other purposes like uh, thematic evenings with talks. Uh, with, it's kind of a cozy atmosphere in there. So it, it's it's part of our strategy of, of using the buildings actively. And it also, it also shows the, the change from the first generation building to a second generation building. Uh, in first generation buildings you can see an ethnic, you may see an ethnic architecture or uh, ethnic uh, building styles. But with, with this building uh, you can see that this is a very, uh, very common American frame house and uh, the transportation of materials on the train made these buildings look similar because you had a mass transportation of materials. So they all uh, buildings looked alike and you could not discern any ethnic traits in them. Uh, but you see the, the size, you, the Gundersen cabin, you see the, the big size of this building as compared to that, uh, the cabin. So this church was originally called the Oak Ridge Lutheran Church. It was located in Houston County, Minnesota, close to the, uh, to the town of Spring Grove, which is an ethnic Norwegian town in the south, very southeastern corner of the state. Uh, it was uh, built in 1896, uh, and it was organized by families that were living in the outskirts of the Norwegian settlement because they had so far to travel to the main church. So they built this church, organized it, and uh, different from Norway is that they, uh, the congregations organized uh, the building of the church themselves. They paid for the salary of uh, the pastor. They had to send out a letter of call to a pastor. In Norway, the state church, church uh, in a state church, the, the, the uh, pastors were paid by the, by the state. Uh, so the, the congregations in the United States had, had more power in a way. And in fact, women were an important force in the con congregations because they had bazaars and organized um, to get income uh, to the church functions. And uh, dif different from Norway, the churches in the United States were not only prayer houses, 
uh, but also places where you could gather with social functions. So it was the hub of the community. So we had Kvinneforening, uh, Ladies Aid, Ungdomsforening, um, Youth Societies, uh, choirs, and various uh, activities that took place here. This is where many uh, younger people uh, fell in love and married also. Um, here is where you could exchange, uh, you could sell land to another parishioner. So this was uh, more than just the, the, uh, the church. Um, in the 1930s, uh, that was when you had the, the maximum of uh, members. That was the heyday uh, of, of this church. And this, the, there was an addition built. This, this um, part of the church was built at the time. Uh, but then in the late 1960s, um, many, many people, following World War II, many people had moved to town, to the cities. So the population sank, uh, decreased, and there were not any, enough sufficient members to support the church. So they had to close their doors in 1967. So the church was there, a uh, foundation was organized to take care of the of repair work and the cemetery. But then the church was standing like this, empty for 25 years. But then our, the former director here came over and he met these uh, representatives from the foundation and they agreed to, to give the church to the museum. They gave an additional amount uh, to support the build, rebuilding of the church. So the church was rebuilt here. It was um, reconsecrated. It was uh, by the, the vice bishop of uh, Hamar in 2002 and the Norwegian ambassador to the United States, Knut Wollebeck, held the inauguration speech. So, and also in 1914, many Norwegian Americans were here to give a, a, a big gift from the, from the, the immigrant Norwegians to the, the storting, to the Norwegian parliament. And that amount grew as the years went by and was used for various purposes. And what was left of that amount that given in 1914 by Norwegian Americans was given to the rebuilding of this church. So this is the, the Norwegian Memorial Immigrant Church. That's what it's called today. In the 1920s, uh, more and more serv services started to be held in English. And an important reason is, is World War I. Uh, in 1917, the United States uh, joined the war. Uh, they were neutral un until then, but they fought the war against Germany, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And uh, in late 1918, the governor of Iowa issued a proclamation that said that, you, that English should be spoken in official places. Otherwise, uh, you were not uh, regarded as a loyal citizen. So therefore, many of started, pastors started to, to held services once in a while in English. And that process went on. But in 1946, when a new pastor came here, uh, all uh, services were held in English. And that was the faith that was the faith in many Norwegian congregations in the United States.
So this this church is very beautiful. Um, is it still in uh, in use in any way? The the yes, the church is in use and it's used by the local congregation here in Utestad uh, some, uh, sometimes uh, every year uh, for their own uh, uh, services. And we also have held ninety. Uh, weddings and baptisms here since the inauguration in 2002. And we have a or, uh, symphonic orchestra that has uh, played here uh, for at least 10 years. And uh, the music that you listen to with the, uh, the old photos and on the slides that you listen to, that CD is recorded in this building. So it has a good acoustic. Um, so, and, and every December, uh, the local pastor comes here and has the kindergartens around here. Uh, he assembled the kindergartens here uh, to tell the gospel. So it's still in use. And, and as we don't have um, any large um, um, amphitheater on the museum, we use this as our um, you know, gathering place for larger crowds. Christopher Schoolhouse, uh, built near Letcher, uh, South Dakota in 1882. Uh, and um, a photo from 1902 shows that the sc school children here had Norwegian, Swedish and German last names. So this reflects the, the ethnic composition of, of the area. And uh, this is uh, a schoolhouse that's been well preserved. Um, when the school was Closed in 1968, the, a former pupil took care of the building and transported it to his farm and had it as his uh, school museum for 35 years before he donated that to the Norwegian Immigrant Museum. So we're very thankful for all those individuals who have given uh, buildings to our collections. Um, and here you see a uh, normal schoolhouse. Um, in American schools you had, um, they, they, they taught um, English oral and, and written English, arithmetics, music, uh, natural sciences and also uh, history, the state's history and also national history and international. But here you can say that the, the time has stood still for many years. Uh, and the, the school uh, closed in 1968 because of uh, it was a school um, consolidation. So the pupils had to move to the closest town. Um, but when I have visitors in this building, um, I usually ask them, is there something on the walls that reveal that this is not a Norwegian uh, uh, school building? So can you see anything here that reminds us of that is not Norwegian. <laughs> and I, I think also um, the the capital letters in uh, handwriting is different yes. from, uh, from the style that we use here. Right, so right. Yes, cool. yes. And um, also the second illustration that you see down there 
to the Declaration of Independence, which is also a, uh, a uniting uh, document. Um, and it says that all men are created equal. And I usually ask, um, were all people equal in, in, in the, the British colonies in 1776? For instance, some groups that we can say, that the, are the groups that we can say that were not equal to, yeah. to other? They were suppressed then, yes. Right, yes, yes. Absolutely. And I can also add that the, the, the buildings here have all been located on lands that be, belong to the indigenous population. And the, the indigenous population they were not present at the time that the Norwegian settlers came to the area uh, in the land taking. They had been either uh, moved forcibly uh, to the west or had signed treaties with the federal, US federal government and had, had moved. But I think that this is a missing part of the Norwegian immigration history that, that we have to take into account that a, a whole population or populations of, of various nations were living on the same grounds that the Norwegians settled on. So the buildings that you see here, built by Norwegian Americans, have, that those are the first buildings used by white persons ever on that land, which is also uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. But we must keep in mind that, uh, that, that uh, these episodes of the history of, of suppression and also that, um, that Norwegians prospered because of a historic uh, development, the forcibly re removal of an indigenous population. Hmm. So, so you're saying that, that uh, the Norwegian settlers, um, they settled on land that the indigenous people considered their land. Um, would you say that, that this is, has similarities to what happened in Norway with the, the Sami population? Yes, there are similarities. And the, the perception of the, the, statues, of the status of the land is, is very different from uh, indigenous culture and to a uh, Norwegian ethnic uh, culture. Norwegian ethnic Norwegians consider land as a, a sign of wealth and status, that to own land gave status in society. Uh, but both uh, Indian Americans and also the Sami population, the indigenous population, regarded land as a communal, um, um, as communal, that's something that was owned in common and did not have that ownership in mind. They used the land and, and lived off the land. Uh, so you see some, some similarities here. Um, when uh, Native Americans were removed from their land in, in the United States, uh, the US federal um, government uh, sent in surveyors to survey the land and to make it available for, uh, for pur purchase. And it gave, uh, and then they sold out in pieces to newcomers. They preferred uh, white settlers. Um, so in fact, the, there was a, this, the, the racial, it was a racial hierarchy where, where uh, the Anglo-Saxon elite uh, was kind of uh, decided who were, uh, how, where you were located on that, that, in that hierarchy. Norwegians were preferred. Native Americans were toward the bottom uh, of that uh, hierarchy. Uh, in Norway, you have the same thing. Uh, the, the Sami population in Norway was forcibly uh, assimilated uh, culturally uh, into the nation building of Norway from the mid 19th century. And, um, and the same land there, they regarded the land as communal, as in, only in common. But, um, but there were uh, Norwegians, I think Norwegians were eager to regard it as the same land as uh, land that could be owned uh, and that could be settled on uh, as, as farmers. So we're two different uh, ways of perceiving uh, land. It's, 
here we have our, the guide at the museum, Anna, and uh, you will then say a few words about this new exhibit at the Norwegian Immigrant Museum. I'm the guide during the summers. I will tell you a little bit about this exhibition inside. Uh, in this part, 50 individuals have been interviewed about items uh, that their ancestors maybe owned. And it tells a lot about their story, about uh, the heritage uh, from being from a uh, family of immigrants or Norwegian immigrants also. I believe there are two or uh, three people who we've uh, interviewed who uh, tell. And this object right here uh, is uh, from the St. Olaf's College. The college was started by Norwegian immigrants in the late 1800s and uh, some have ancestors who have graduated here and the college sweater is a bit uh, untraditional maybe but very uh, traditional for, uh, for Norway by the design. As you can see it's a knitted sweater. This person shows an artifact uh, about her native heritage which is both native to America. Sometimes these type of artifacts are more than just an item. There are, there's the spirit that is with them that you can connect to your culture and especially a person as uh, this woman. She's a Native American and a Scandinavian but she doesn't totally fit in, in either uh, stereotype. She's often asked where she's from and uh, she says there's a sense of otherness because she doesn't have this stereotypical appearance. Tadia, thank you so much for this walk around your museum and for your very uh, deep knowledge of what we are looking at and uh, learning about. Um, I uh, hope that we can meet again. We might meet here or we might even meet over in Minnesota. And Maybe um, maybe you will meet some of uh, you who are viewing this program. Thank you, Jorun, and thank you for visiting the Norwegian Immigrant Museum. Uh, it's been a privilege, and uh, I'm very honored to to have shown you around uh, at the muse museum. Uh, the museum has strong ties to the Norwegian American community and communities, and we very much want to um, to keep that. Uh, that tie very strong um, and, and thank you and, and we hope that uh, you enjoyed uh, the museum and that you wish to, uh, to visit us. I will also add that uh, in 2025 uh, there will be a bicentennial commemoration of Norwegian immigration to America and we have taken an initiative nationally in Norway and we cooperate to organize activities and we also cooperate with uh, institutions in the United States. Um, so I'm very glad that we could have this tour uh, and to be a part of the festival. Thank you.